Hey everyone, it's Ash here. So I had the topic for today's episode and then I got an advanced copy of a book that caught my eye and I kind of had to talk about this story. But before I get in, a bit into the background of why this story became a desperate one for me to tell, I'm going to do the quick reminders and a fair do warning as well as a small update about the podcast itself. First off, fair dues. This story takes place during a genocide, so there will be some traumatic elements. Please be kind to yourself and take it as slowly as you need to, but I really do stress the importance of the story that I'm telling and the message of hope that does come from tragedy. I guess next up would be the update about the podcast itself. As longtime listeners may have noticed, I've been doing either solo or guest episodes the last few times. This is the first official solo episode, and the majority of episodes from now on will sadly be solo. Kat's new job is taking a lot of her time and energy, so something needs to go in order for her to be able to be successful. There are absolutely no hard feelings, and Kat will be coming back in an episode or two as a guest, since I found some new information on one of her previous episode topics that we want to cover. She will be coming back every so often as a guest, and I'll continue having some other guests as well. I do have some really exciting ones lined up for future episodes. But the majority of them will be solo hosted by me and we're going to be touring the lesser known side of history for a long time to come. Now the reminders. As I've said before, the goal of this podcast is just to share pieces of history that many don't know about. And in order to do that, people need to know about the podcast. So I beg of you, please rate, review, and share so that others can find us. You can also come to our Instagram page where I have started a weekday session of Tuesday to Friday facts about that day in history. We have some really fun ones up and would love to have some conversations with you all about these historical events that just don't have enough information for a full podcast episode. If you are a super supporter of the podcast, I also implore you to check us out on Buy Me A Coffee. The link is in the show notes as well as on our IG link tree and the website. Any donations along with memberships would be greatly appreciated as it will really help with getting access to more historical documents, nonfiction books that are way more expensive because they're behind paywalls or published through university presses. With all that said, let's move on to today's topic. So I came across this book written by Henry Oster and Dexter Ford on NetGalley while I was checking out the new history nonfiction books for some inspiration. Ever since I was little, I have loved reading about the Holocaust and learning about the brave souls who had to endure the Nazi regime. Part of my family is German, while another part is British, and so I've had some interesting stories from both sides of the war from my own family tree, as well as an early education through children's novels that take place during this time period. My mum has continued on with the love of World War II novels, where it's basically all that she will read. So in a way, this episode is kind of dedicated to her, as I think I might have found a true life story from the Holocaust that she hasn't heard yet. At least I kind of hope I have. The second thing that caught my eye when I saw this book on NetGalley was the horse on the cover. I'm a horse girl and always have been. It's my dream to see War Horse on stage one day, as the horses who live through wars have such fascinating stories, as many other animals probably had as well. Just like the humans during the Holocaust, some animals thrive. Think of the, the fleas and rats and mice, etc., who were given ripe feeding grounds in the conditions that the Nazis made, while others suffered horribly, pets who were abandoned or mistreated, and the horses who were kind of forced into the fray of the war. The horse part of the story, though, will come a little later. Today we're going to talk about Henry Oster. He was born Heinz Adolf Oster and grew up in Cologne, Germany. One of his early childhood memories was when he walked alongside his father on the way to vote in the 1933 national election. He was about five years old. The Oster family was well liked in their neighborhood and to Henry his father seemed very important. In fact, it was a great treat to get to go on an adventure just him and his father, as Hans Oster was the manager of several small department stores, so he was usually quite busy. On that day, little Henry even got to stop at the confectioner's store and get Schlosslein, vanilla-flavored whipped cream. Hans Oster was a veteran of the German army called the Wehrmacht, fighting in the First World War. He had been wounded when a piece of shrapnel sliced his cheek open, leaving him with a scar and a medal for bravery. There was no reason not to defend his fatherland, and the whole family didn't see themselves as anything other than good German citizens. 
The only differences were that they went to the synagogue on Fridays instead of the Grand Cathedral on Sundays, and they sent their only son to the German Jewish school, where the only different class taught was Hebrew. But when Henry went to school for the first day in 1934 at the age of six, he had his first lesson in the new world that started on that day in 1933 when he got to have an adventure with his father. He and his new classmates were brutally attacked by a gang of Hitler youth as they left their classroom at the end of the day. All their parents were waiting outside for the kids, but the mob of teens and younger 20-year-olds had overpowered the adults with their own parents and group leaders in the background to watch proudly. Each of the youth were in their uniforms, shouting angrily at the much younger Jewish kids and had daggers on their belts, as well as being armed with rocks and sticks which they would throw or use to hit the children as they tried to run through the crowd to the safety of their parents. Each of the young kids had a cardboard cone that was a German tradition for the first day of school. The cones were full of treats that the kids would take to their first day of school as a reminder of the amazing snack that would be opened when they got home as a reward for making it through the new situation. Sadly, the Hitler youth narrowed their focus on these cones during their attacks and would die for the candies and toys that fell out of the broken cones. Finally, a few local policemen arrived at the school to stop the attack and the children could go home. None of the kids were seriously injured, but they definitely started to feel those first pangs of fear that would haunt them for years to come. Let's put this world that Henry was living into in perspective for any listener who isn't as aware of the hardships that Germany was going through at the time. We all know about the Great Depression in the Americas, as it is what was taught in their schools the most. But Europe was also struggling, and even worse off than we were on this side of the world. They didn't get the Roaring Twenties the way that we did. Instead, they were already struggling to make ends meet after a devastating world war that ruined many homes and families. When Hitler came into power in 1933, the German dollar was pretty much monopoly money, and the people were desperate for someone to bring them hope. The charismatic man named Adolf Hitler promised them a much better life and a cause that would make them quote-unquote great again. If that statement sounds familiar, it should because Trump wasn't the first crazy man to make these promises, and he won't be the last. All Hitler had to do was put the blame on someone, and he decided it would be the Jews and the others in society. Germany wouldn't be able to heal until the Jewish population, the disabled population, and the gypsy population, just to name a few, were put in their place and removed. It's happened to the indigenous people, the Japanese people, the African Americans, it's still happening to still to women, the LGBTQ plus community. People blamed everyone of Asian descent recently for the COVID-19 pandemic. People of any color that isn't pale white are being targeted. Hell, we target people every day online and in person just for the fandom that they might enjoy. Hitler called it the final solution. We now just call it canceling people. But rant aside, having an enemy was the number one solution in Nazi Germany. It wasn't just Hitler. Many people that we still revere for their excellence in the fields had similar ideas to Hitler. Charles Lindbergh, the pilot, Henry Ford, the car manufacturer, and Walt freaking Disney. The hatred for Jews ran so deep that Hitler was convinced that Germany was stabbed in the back during the First World War. It wasn't that Germany lost the war. It was that the Jewish population worked from within alongside communists to undermine the German army. To tie this all back into Henry's story, this would mean that Hitler most likely believed that Jewish German soldiers like Henry's father were faking their war effort and actively fighting against Germany while wearing a German uniform. Eugenics became the solution in Hitler's mind, but he isn't the only one who came up with it. It was already being done in the USA and pretty much enforced by law, as evident in the Buck v. Bell Supreme Court ruling in 1927 that upheld the law allowing forced sterilizations in mental hospitals. Carrie Buck had been raped by her foster father at the age of 17 and was committed into the mental hospital because she was pregnant from the act. The state of Virginia forced the sterilization on her and her sister once she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. The lawsuit that followed had an 8-1 to majority vote by the court to give the practice uh, with a quote from one of the most respected judges of the time being, three generations of imbeciles are enough. 
These three generations were Carrie, her biological mother, and her newborn daughter. Germany modeled their laws after this American one and started implementing them on the disabled community for years before the first Jewish captive would be killed in a concentration camp and secretly continued throughout the war up to 1945. Over 200,000 people would be killed for their disabilities alone by the Nazi regime. But Hitler's number one concern was Jews and communists. A month after taking office, Dachau was established just outside of Munich as a prisoner camp for literally anyone who would oppose him. His next step was the Hitler Youth, as he knew that he had to indoctrinate the young so that within a few years he would have enough people who fully believed in him and his vision to carry out unspeakable acts. Let's go back to Henry's personal story now that there is a bit more background into how anyone could allow these upcoming events to happen. Henry's family were lucky enough to have a radio and so they could listen to Hitler's speeches for the first few years of the Reich. To a young German boy, Hitler's voice was enthralling and Henry loved seeing all the German pride that spilled out into the streets with the blood red Nazi flags and the greetings of Heil Hitler every time someone passed another. But reality quickly sunk in as all of the laws surrounding him started to change slowly over the months. It took about two years of slow changes before the Nuremberg Laws were declared in 1935. Jewish families like Henry's had everything taken away. All valuables had to be handed to the Sturmblung, also known as the Stormtroopers or Brown Shirts. Even the family radio was taken along with all of Henry's mother's jewelry. His father's veteran benefits were cut off, and the Jews who died fighting in World War I had their names chiseled off of all memorials. One day, Hans went into his company office and found a Nazi official at his desk and his accounts frozen. No compensation, just dismissal from his own business. There was nothing for them to do as they were banned from every park, movie theater, public transport, and even their own community centers. Unless you were a household, you couldn't gather with more than three or four other Jews. They were even cut off from their newspaper and magazine subscriptions, so they had to find their information any way they could, if they could get any at all. With the new laws, the family had to leave their lovely apartment and move into a one-bedroom and a kitchen apartment in the poorer area of Cologne. Hans quickly became de depressed and was forced to travel west to work in a Nazi work camp for the majority of each month. He'd come home with very little money and no light in his eyes. He was working as a slave to build the Siegfried Line, which was a huge fortification on the French border that consisted of concrete bunkers, tank traps, and artillery positions. Hans was paid only enough for his family to be able to get enough groceries to stay alive. The apartment was only holding two or three people for about three weeks, but then quickly became crowded as family started pouring in. Henry and his family were the only ones who could find a place to live, so as the rest of the family were evicted from their homes, they moved into the tiny apartment with people having to sleep in shifts due to the one-bed situation. Henry would sleep on a little wooden bench in the kitchen, in rotation with his cousin. Henry, of course, was still school age at this time, but he wasn't allowed in any sort of school. One of his former teachers, however, would sneak into the apartment when they could in order to give some lessons in Hebrew and other significant subjects so Henry wouldn't be too far behind. It was all done in secret the best they could as everyone spied on everyone in Nazi Germany. There are cases of children reporting their own parents in order to gain brownie points, especially if it meant that you could one-up your neighbor who was spying right back on you. Up until 1938, Jews had opportunities to leave. But not all could, as many countries refused to take them or they were stuck where they were. Henry's family was in the latter. Hans couldn't leave since he was enslaved by the German government, and the family wasn't going to leave him behind. They had no money or resources to leave even if they wanted to. All they could do was try to stay together. November 9th, 1938. Days before, a German diplomat was shot by a 17-year-old Jewish kid in Paris because they were outraged by the treatment of their people back in Germany. On the 9th, the diplomat succumbed to their wounds and died, sparking an outrage throughout the German streets. This day also marks the 15-year anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, which was Hitler's first attempt to take over the government. 
In their tightly packed apartment on this night, Henry and his entire family were huddled together as the streets filled with angry yelling and glass shattering. The few remaining Jewish shops were being destroyed right outside their window. There was no way of the family to know what was happening other than by what they could hear as they had been cut off by the Nazis. Soon, other relatives came running up the stairs with the news that everything was burning. Smoke filled the air and orange flames created these shadows of the Nazis as the streets filled with broken glass. Over 90 people were killed that night as the Nazis let themselves and their dogs loose on the streets. On that same night of Kristallnacht, the SS barged into the apartment to arrest Hans Oster with guns pointing and German shepherds pulling at their leashes. The leader of the SS group stopped in the doorway, looked at Hans, and then turned around. This is a mistake, was all that came out of his mouth, and the SS officers left. It turned out that the SS leader used to be a doorman at a hotel that Hans used to meet with salesmen to examine goods that he'd be looking to supply in his department stores. Hans had been kind to the doorman with tips each time he would use the hotel for these meetings. Hans suspected that the reason that he was spared on that night when 30,000 other Jews were not as lucky. The slave labor was also over as of that night. All the family could do was huddle together in the tiny apartment and wait. They could leave the apartment during the day with a curfew of 6 p.m., but they were always at risk when they did so. All Jews had to wear yellow stars sewn onto the left front and back of whatever they were wearing. One day, Henry was out to get some vegetables for dinner when he was pulled into an alleyway by some other German boys. He thought he was going to die, but the boys just pulled down his pants so they could get a good look at his circumcised penis, laughing at him and taunting him. Henry escaped before they could get in a beating on top of the humiliation. One of Henry's cousins had been arrested that November night and sent to the Butchenwald concentration camp but then had been released along with some of the other lucky first Jewish captives. This cousin told the family about the horrors he saw and endured in the camp and made it his mission to escape. Henry never found out if he made it or not and chose to believe that his cousin had made it into Switzerland rather than the alternative. October 1941, Henry is now 12 years old as a courier delivered an official letter of resettlement. All three members of his immediate family were allowed to take one suitcase for all of them and ordered to report to a collection center first thing in the morning on Monday. Many people asked Henry later in his life as to why they never tried to escape or hide. His answer has always been that there was nowhere to go. All they could do was try to stay together, keep their heads down, and stay alive. It was German culture and programming to just fall into line and do what you had to do. The Oster family never got to the Monday Collection Center. The Germans had decided to raid homes before the weekend was over, in case any of the families decided to try to run before the deadline. All three woke up to a similar scene as they did on Crystal Knock, as soldiers banged on the door with their dogs snarling and weapons at the ready. They were forced outside and dragged down the street to a collection center close to the railroad station where an estimated 1,000 others were crammed together waiting for the morning train. Hours later, the tightly packed train cars arrived in Łódź, Poland. The ghetto in Łódź was the second largest ghetto next to the Warsaw Ghetto, with 160,000 people jammed into two empty thousand rooms. The room that Henry and his pe parents were pushed into was about the size of a child's bedroom and held a total of 21 people inside. Inside the ghetto was an oddity. Streetcar tracks ran through the middle of it for the general Polish population to be able to travel throughout the city on their daily business. In order to ensure that the Jewish prisoners wouldn't escape, a wooden bridge was built to connect the two sides of the ghetto lined with barbed wire. At first, the Jewish could see inside the train cars and the Polish population could see the ghetto. But later on, the Germans painted the car windows so that the regular people couldn't see the horrific conditions of the ghetto as it deteriorated even more throughout time. Both of Henry's parents got jobs inside the ghetto within a few days as they were promised extra food rations if they worked. Henry's mother went to the factory that made the iron toe and heel plates that made the German boots sound loud and menacing as they marched down the cobblestone streets while Hans went to work on keeping the ghetto fence in good condition through countless repairs. These jobs helped the family survive, 
but so did a letter that Hans Oster held from the Kaiser, who detailed his war service and medals. Only the littlest pieces of luck kept anyone from being selected for the camp transports at any given time. Just 50 miles away was one of those camps called Kelmino, which had no work opportunities or even barracks, as the very few prisoners survived their first and only day there. Henry himself was even eager for work, since it meant the extra food rations and something to do in general while he was stuck in the ghetto. So he went to the work camp in the ghetto, just before his 13th birthday, with his soup bowl strung around his neck, as it was the most precious piece of property that anyone in the ghetto had. If you didn't have your bowl, there was no soup for you. The lineup even took a good lot of knowledge, as one wanted to know exactly where to stand for the most calories possible from the liquid. The front of the line got liquid only, while the back of the line risked the soup running out. If you got a leaf of cabbage, it was a good day, but if you got a tiny bit of carrot, it was like winning the lottery. Luckily, Henry ran across one of his cousins from his mother's side in the ghetto, whose family used to run a farm. Jacob was a big shot in the ghetto, as he was considered a farming expert, and it was rare to find a German-Jewish farmer those days. In order to be able to feed all the Jewish citizens in the ghetto, the Germans decided to make a small farming project inside, so they didn't have to use outside sources. Jacob was put in charge, and he quickly hired his little cousin, giving Henry his 12-hour-a-day job and an extra food ration. Now, the Wutsch ghetto was only a holding place for the Jews. The larger concentration camps only had so much room in them, so the Nazis used the ghettos as a place to hold the Jewish population as they worked them for as long as possible. Once they became quote-unquote useless in their eyes, blocks of the ghetto streets would be swept away in the night onto transport trains. Unfortunately for Hans Oster, his time was coming up faster than anyone in the family had wanted. His job at the ghetto walls was extremely dangerous, whether it was the job itself injuring the workers or Nazi firing squads who would randomly shoot as a warning or as punishment. One member of the team had been killed with a bullet in the head when they reached through the fence to grab a package that had been left on the other side. Hans had already struggled with depression before the war and had been starving for months with his calorie output being much higher than his intake due to the meager rations. One day, Hans came back to the room early, being so tired that he could barely climb the stairs to the room in the first place. Within a few hours, he passed away from overwork and starvation. The Nazi death certificate claimed his cause of death to be pneumonia, and the place of death being in the ghetto hospital. His own family had to clean up his body from the room and had to leave him gently by the gutter. Overnight, Hans's body was looted by the desperate citizens of the ghetto before the body wagon came through in the morning to collect the bodies piled out in the streets as it did daily. In the ghetto, a burial ceremony was permitted by the Nazis for grieving families, and Henry regretted the fact that he couldn't say the Kaddish prayer as he had not been able to participate in his bar mitzvah yet. All of the prisoners in the ghetto also found themselves forced to witness horrors on what the Nazis called Sunday's Entertainment. The officers had created a hanging tree in one of the unplanted fields, and every Sunday they'd march their prisoners out to the field so they could watch their kinspeople be hung. You know how we see reels of pets with signs around their neck saying what they had done wrong and we laugh at those silly animals? This was the Nazi sadistic version of that, as each Jew that they murdered had a sign with their name and their crime around their necks. Crimes ranged from escape attempts to disobedience or to the theft of a carrot. The hangmen were two Jewish-Polish brothers who took the job in order to get extra bread in the mornings, which they shared with Henry while they worked the fields. July of 1943, and Henry gets woken in the night for a raid. It was his building's turn to rotate out to one of the three camps that Woods fernaled into. Henry and his mother decided to hide in the small attic space in order to escape the raid. One of the Germans heaved the trap door open and shone his light around the space, but Henry had tucked himself and his mother into a good, tight, dark corner where they could lie flat and try not to even breathe. The next morning, they acted like nothing had happened, even though their building was completely empty. As long as they showed up for work, they got their rations, as the Germans didn't always check their lists when it came to who was going to their death. Henry pulled his mother to the attic again a few months later, hiding out for the next raid the same way. 
All that he knew was that when people left, they never came back, and he wanted to protect his mother. August of 1944 came, and Henry got a notice that he and his mother would be reassigned to the organization of the fall harvest. However, when they got to the reporting area, there was chaos. Too many people had been assigned to the job, with about five to six hundred people cramped together between two buildings, hoping for the upgrade. The shutters of the buildings were closed, but not for long, as they suddenly slammed open, and Nazi officers were right there with machine guns pointing at the confused Jews. They were never being reassigned. It was just an easy way to get them all in one spot so they could be transported. Families were split apart as men begged to be allowed to go get their wives and children, but their pleas were unheard as they were shoved into the closed boxcars, about a hundred people or more per car. It was standing room only and extremely hot. A few of the older people died in the car with Henry and his mother when they couldn't take the conditions any longer. The train stopped for a few hours partway through the journey as the Nazis waited for night to fall. People were easier to her in the darkness when their senses were confused. When they arrived at their destination, men were forced to the right and women to the left. Henry's mother was ripped from him by one of the officers as he tried to hold on to her for life. It would be the last time he ever saw her. When Henry reached the next sorting area, he was sent to the right along with the other stronger men while the weaker boys and men went to the left. He followed orders and watched as the Jews who had been police in the ghetto were beaten by the Nazis, one of them dying at his feet. He stripped down, took the acidic cold shower that they were all forced to take, and had his head shaved. In the courtyard, the Jews were all banded together and started swapping the blue and white striped clothing, caps, and shoes in order to get the best fitting uniform they could. Finally, one of the other Jews said the dreaded words, signaling to the others as to where they were. Welcome to Auschwitz. By now, Henry was 15 years old, though he probably didn't look it, and his goal was to be invisible. If the Nazis couldn't see them, then they couldn't select him. But one night, as he was attempting to, to use the latrine, the Nazis called out for only teenagers to report to the courtyard. A couple hundred teenage boys were quickly arranged into rows. Suddenly, Henry found himself speaking up from the back, calling out that he spoke German. One of the officers then pointed at him and had him move to the left, along with another sparse number of boys who looked stronger and sharper than the rest of them. Unknowingly, Henry had spared his life for a little while longer. He and the other selected boys were marched to another barrack, where they were catalogued and tattooed. Henry was now B7648. They were all then marched to some trucks and moved from Auschwitz-Birkenau to the main camp, Auschwitz-1. Henry's new block elder was a German who had done the worst crime imaginable in German culture. He'd murdered his mother. The 131 new recruits were then counted out and separated into groups of 10 to 12 boys. When they entered the new barracks, they were surprised not to see rows of shelf beds, but rows of stalls filled with snorting horses. There were 28 horses in Henry's stable, all of them pregnant mares whose foals were to be used for the war effort. Each of the boys were assigned three to four mares each to care for. These mares were much more important than the boys, and it was made clear that if anything happened to them or their foals, the boy in charge of the specific horses would be immediately added to the Sunday entertainment. Even pocketing or taking a nibble of the horse's food was a death penalty. Luckily, the officers trained the boys on how to care for the horses, and they did so from just before dawn to midnight. Henry had a glimmer of hope until he came to realize that the horses were well cared for before they even arrived. Who had taken care of them, and why were they replaced? Was this possible long-term job not as long-term as he thought? Henry's mares were named Mutti and Olga, but he was also tasked with caring for the large stallion of that particular stable, Barbarossa. The guards liked Henry because he spoke German, while the other boys only knew Polish, so he could communicate with the guards better and stay out of trouble. It did help a little, as the boys all figured out ways to steal a few oats or carrots and even the mare's milk after they had given birth. One day, while Henry had the two mares out grazing, Olga suddenly went into labor. Henry had swore that it would be muddy first, as she was the largest belly of the mares, but Olga decided that she was ready while they were in the middle of a depression of the pasture, 
where water was pooling, and just when the 4 p.m. siren started blaring, signaling that the horses were to be back in the stables for evening chores and a roll call. Henry was stuck. He could either abandon Olga in the field and risk death if anything happened to her and the foal, or he could stay with her and miss roll call, triggering an escape attempt protocol when he is found missing. Henry chose to stay with the horse and foal. He quickly remembered his training and checked on the foal's position. The foal's head was slightly to one side, so he had to reach his arm in and reposition it so the foal could slip out. As the foal came out, Henry could immediately see that it was stillborn. An infection had been going through the barn that was causing a lot of miscarriages and stillbirths. Of course, it was this moment that the chaos started up in the camp as the officers started rushing about looking for Henry. When he called them over to where he was, they didn't believe who he was at first, but slowly they started to trust him as he repeated the reasons for him staying with the mare in German over and over again. A German Jew was rare at this point in Auschwitz, and it was now mainly filled with Polish Jews. Two soldiers stayed with Henry as they waited for Olga to be able to get up and eat the placenta so she could make it back to the barn. The SS vet was who really saved Henry, though. The vet couldn't show any sympathy or kindness to the Jews, so he yelled at Henry in order to get the message across that the foal's death was not his fault. It was the only way for the vet to be able to save the boy's life. As the stallion's keeper, Henry was also tasked with ensuring that the breeding process of all the mares went as smoothly as possible. In a way, these mares were sexually assaulted in order to get the job done. The whole process happened in the confined stalls of the stables, so that the mares couldn't change their minds and have room to trot off away from Barbarossa. At one point during one of the breeding sessions, Henry even fell between the stallion's hind legs in the frenzy, as the Germans yelled and cheered in delight at the spectacle. A small breather here before I get to a point of Henry's story that even he had trouble talking about. One of my resources for this episode is Henry's testimony for a Visual History Foundation in 1995. He's gone all over doing presentations and testimonies to share his story of survival and the stories of those who didn't survive. But my other main source is the book that is coming out on April 4th, and that is where he tells this story. This story that he couldn't bear to say out loud because he couldn't trust his voice. Not for his family, and not for those who needed to hear about the German brutality of the Holocaust. The number one fear that the Nazis had at the camps was of their Jewish prisoners escaping. Just an attempt meant that anyone was on the line of being selected for death. A successful escape was even worse. It wasn't only yourself that you needed to worry about if you tried to escape, but the countless other Jews that you were condemning to an even earlier, possibly more brutal, death. Henry and the other stable boys had a reprieve from seeing some of these horrors, but on a Saturday night, Henry witnessed it firsthand. There was something happening at the gates, and as the boys drew nearer on their way back to the bunkers, the last four of them were cut off from the group by one of the officers, Henry included. They were put against a wall and ordered to wait. There were other Jewish people there as well, so the boys were at the very back of the group as they were the last to be chosen. Then the flaps of the trucks at the other end of the courtyard opened and revealed Nazis at the helm of machine guns. Bullets came flying directly towards the group, and one by one Jewish prisoners in front of them started to drop. When the first wave was done, all four of the stable boys were still alive, Henry having a bullet graze his knee being the worst of the injuries. He noticed a hallway close to them that would lead towards their barracks, and on his quiet command, all four boys made a run for it. They somehow managed to dodge all the guards and make it back to their bunker. Each boy kept their story quiet as they knew that if they talked, Someone would rat them out for extra food, and they'd be killed immediately with no chance of escape. Forty-three Jews died in that particular shooting, about ten for every escapee that day. There is so much more to Henry's story, but I really want to encourage everyone to read his book to get more of the details. It really is a brilliant story about the horrors that the young man endured and his strength in staying alive. What I have described in this episode is really a cursory look at his trials. After Auschwitz, Henry and the other stable boys were moved to another camp where they were forced to wait in cleaner conditions, aka false hope, 
until they were sent on the January 23rd, 1945 death march to another set of trains. He found himself along with the other 400 or so survivors of this journey in Buchenwald, a.k.a. back in Germany. In April of 1945, Buchenwald was liberated by the American Third Army. Henry was slowly given food so his body wouldn't give up from the trauma of eating too much before it could process the nutrients again. He was 16 years old in the body of a 13-year-old boy with a weight of only 78 pounds, the same weight of a healthy German shepherd. He was an orphan, an orphan who was afraid of freedom, afraid of the people trying to help him in case they were lying, and officially suffering from severe PTSD. But Henry went on to survive and even thrive. He found a woman that he loved, went to UCLA to get a degree, became an optometrist, spoke up about the Holocaust, and had an amazing, loving family. He was the last living survivor of the 2011 Jews who were rounded up from Cologne in 1941. In March of 2019, he passed away from a short battle with lung cancer at the age of 91. As I said just a little bit ago, I didn't fully go into Henry's story because I want everyone to read his book and listen to his testimony. I can give you the facts and tell you about it, but coming from his own mouth is much more powerful and haunting. The acts that were committed during the Holocaust were horrific and should never have happened, but all we can do now is ensure that it never happens again. Henry survived so he could tell this tale and spread his kindness and good soul to others. So let's take the time, soak in his words, and embrace that kindness so we can share it ourselves. Please either pre-order or put The Stable Boy of Auschwitz on your wish list right now. It is going to be available everywhere as of April 4th, 2023, and it is well worth the read. Please also check out the YouTube video of Henry giving his testimony. The link is in the show notes, as well as the other testimonies that I will have a link to in the notes. I've put links to various Holocaust memorial resources so that you can check them out and learn more about the camps mentioned as well as other testimonies. We will see you all next time.